we've come this morning with all the different messages that float around during the Christmas season. We gather together to remember what the real story of Christmas is really about. And so each Sunday morning during Advent, we're talking about, or we're telling another part of the Christmas story. And we also remember the Christmas story by the songs that we're singing, also by the Advent candles that we lit this morning. Now, the candle we lit this morning was the candle of peace. Uh, Peace, we've talked about this often, but as a reminder, the idea of peace at the time of Jesus, and even today I would say, is the idea of shalom. And peace is not just in the Bible the absence of conflict. Peace is when everything is the way that it's meant to be. Or you might say, peace is when everything is in right relationship with each other. Now, today's story, I love, I love this part of the Christmas story. Um, you see, the Christmas story, when it was told in the day in which it happened, it was a very subversive story. You see, when the Christmas story was told and the Christians proclaimed peace on earth, the angels proclaimed peace on earth, on earth, there was already a very particular understanding of peace in the Roman Empire. And there was an understanding about who was the one who gave peace and how peace was achieved. But when the Christian story appears, the Christian story, the Jesus story says, you know what? This whole way that the Roman Empire talks about peace, it's not the real thing. But we have a message for you about real peace. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, real peace, and we'll talk about how this story, the story of Jesus is told by Luke, um, is a subversive story, and hopefully it will help us understand a little bit better about who Jesus is and what he's come to do for us. So with that, let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 2, we're looking at verses 1 through 7 this morning. PowerPoint clicker, thanks Justin. Now, as my son just pointed out, that's not right. Well, it's pretty close. I just cut off. What's I doing? Okay, so I'm going to read to you the beginning of it, and then you can catch on to the, that's the, I'm so sorry. Okay, Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their hometown to register. So Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, this Christmas story is told by a man named Luke. Now, Luke is a physician. Luke is an historian. Now, Luke never met Jesus personally, but Luke wanted to get the Jesus story right, and he wanted to write it down to pass it on to anyone who would listen to the story of Jesus because the story of Jesus had touched his life. So Luke went to meet with everybody he could meet. He met with apostles, the disciples. He met with anybody who saw the work of Jesus, and he compiled all of this information. And then when he got all this information, he he had to decide what he would use, and then he would craft his version of the Jesus story, which we call the Gospel of Luke. Now, as you can imagine, as he interviewed, Luke had a ton of information, but he had to whittle it down and say, well, These are the most important details that I want to include in my story to get across the point that I want to get across. Now, what I'd like to do with you this morning is to look at some of the details that Luke supplies in his story of the birth of Jesus, because they give us an idea of the power of the Jesus story. Now, what I'm going to show you in a second, when Luke writes his Gospels, you know, we have Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 3, and so on and so forth. Now, in Luke chapter 1, 2, and 3, what he does is to provide a time stamp to show us at what time in history did this event take place. Let's look at Luke chapter 1. In Luke 1, he's in verse 5, he says, In the time of King Herod of Judea, there's a priest named Zechariah. Now, Luke chapter 2, the second time stamp. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. The third timestamp, Luke 3. Now remember, Luke 3 actually occurs when Jesus is an adult. He's beginning his ministry. So the third timestamp he provides is this. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of, Gal- of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eturia and Trochonitis, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene. Those are hard words. During the high priest of Annas and Caiaphas. Now, who are all of these people that Luke feels a need to tell us about when he tells the Jesus story? All these folks are kind of the who's who. The people who are in charge, from the governors to the emperors. And he even shows us or tells us uh, who the high priests were at the time when Jesus was born. He started his ministry. Now, here's the thing. This is not a good list of people. If you're Jewish and you see these timestamps, these names don't make you happy. They signify and represent the system of Rome and power in which you live in. These are the people who oppress you. These are the people who tax you 90% of your income. These are also people who show you how corrupt the world they live in. You see, Annas and Caiaphas, they're the high priests in Israel. And you know what? Do you know why they were the high priests? Because Rome put them there. And the story says that Annas and Caiaphas got those positions because of treachery and corruption. It would be like, it would be like, I'm your pastor here, but I'm not here because you chose me. I'm here because the governor of Turlock appointed me to be your pastor. You would think that's strange. It's not right. But that's what these names mean to the Jewish people. So when Luke sets out to tell the story of Jesus, he says, I want you to know who's who and who's in charge. Now, I want to focus on Caesar Augustus. Because he's a very interesting character. He's the emperor of Rome at the time that Jesus was born. Now, Caesar Augustus was the name that he took when he became the emperor. But before he became emperor, his name was, does anyone know your history? Octavian. Now, this man named Octavian was adopted by a man named Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar was a dictator in Rome. But here's what happens. Julius Caesar is assassinated. And when Julius Caesar is killed, it leaves this whole kind of power vacuum. And people begin to fight for power. Now, to make a long story short, Octavian comes out on top. He wins. And he becomes the emperor of Rome. Now, this is where the story gets really good. Two things happen when he becomes emperor. The first, he takes the name Caesar Augustus. And second, he goes on a mission to prove his legitimacy as the emperor. Now, it's really interesting. After Julius Caesar died, um, there, was, there was a Roman game going on. And what happened was a comet or a star appeared in the sky. And when people saw this comet and star, they recognized this was an odd thing happening in the heavens. And a rumor began to float around. We don't know where the rumor came from, whether from the common people or from the top. But the rumor went like this. That star in the sky is the soul of Julius Caesar. And that star represented the fact that Julius Caesar, though a man on earth, this was him becoming a god in the heavens. Now, I want you to think about this. If you're Caesar Augustus, and your dad has become a god. Is this good news for you? This is good news for you. And you actually want people to know this. I want to show you, these were, I have three coins I want to show you. I I love this. These three coins were coins that Caesar Augustus minted. So everyone, that's what you use for your money. Here's the first one. Hey, on the left, you have Caesar Augustus. On the right, you have Divus uh, Julia, Julian, which means divine Julius. And then what's the symbol on the right side of, this, of the coin, the back of the coin? That's a star. 
So Caesar Augustus makes this coin to remind everybody that his father is a god. So whenever you bought your bread and you trade in the marketplace, you'd see the coin and remember Julius Caesar is a god. And it's where it gets good. If Julius Caesar is a god, what does that make Caesar Augustus? The son of God. And what's so interesting about this is that son of God was the primary title that Caesar Augustus took upon himself as the emperor of Rome. He called himself the son of God. Here's another coin. Uh, This is, once again, Caesar Augustus, uh, Divi period F, uh, which, here I'm going to mess that word up, uh, Phyllis. And that coin says, uh, Caesar, divine son. So the next coin that he put around was a coin that reminded everybody that not only was his dad a god, but that makes him the son of God. Now, it gets better. There's another title that Caesar Augustus also took upon himself. It was the title Soter, which in Greek means savior. And not only was Caesar Augustus called the Soter or the savior, He was also called the savior of the world because he brought peace to the empire. They call that the Pax Romana. So Caesar Augustus, son of God, savior of the world, coins to remind people that this was the case. Here's the third coin, the last coin I'll show you this morning. Um, Caesar Augustus, again, on the left side. On the right, you have the goddess of peace uh, holding a kadusha and says Pax for peace. And the Kedusha that the goddess is holding is a sign of prosperity. So then the third coin is a sign that uh, Caesar Augustus, savior of the world, the bringer of prosperity and peace. Now it gets even better. Caesar Augustus, son of God, savior of the world, also took on the name Kyrios, which means Lord, and also took on the name I just lost this, fell from my head. So let me look at my notes. Um, Pontifus Maximus, which means high priest. So think about this. If I play Jeopardy with you today, da, 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 da. and I said to you, the category is titles for important people. And I said, Son of God, Savior, Lord, and High Priest, you would say what? Who is Jesus? No, who is Jesus? Don't you watch Jeopardy? Who is Jesus? Jeez. In that day, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was born, or before Jesus was born, if I said, Son of God, Savior, Lord, High Priest, the people would say, who is Caesar? Isn't that fascinating? Some of the prominent titles that we use for Jesus especially at the time of Christmas, before Jesus was born, was attributed to none other than Caesar Augustus himself. And the propaganda of the Roman Empire was that Augustus is the son of God, and if you give him your heart, and if you give him your loyalty, then Caesar will give you peace. As I think about this, I ask myself, is it a coincidence That during the reign of Augustus, who claimed to be the son of God, the most powerful person on earth, who said that his dad was a god because of the star in the sky, is it a coincidence that the one true God decides that when it's time for his real son to come to earth, that he'll announce it by putting a star in the sky? And when God, through the angels, began to proclaim this message to the various people, These are the things that the people said. A messenger messenger to Mary said, The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the one born to you will be called the Son of God. To a group of shepherds, an angel announces, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Soter, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The angels proclaim glory to God in the highest, and on earth pox or peace to those on whom His favor rests. The Christmas story is a little bit like Lion King. How many of you have seen Lion King? No shame. Adults, you can put up your hands. Greatest Disney movie. I love that movie. 
Actually, this last weekend, we had gone to Southern California uh, for a race for Sam, and we watched Lion King in the car on the way there. And in the story of Lion King, Simba, who's the true king, leaves, leaves the place, and then uh, Scar takes over the kingdom. Scar's evil, but he's really the fake king. And then the real king Simba returns, and there's this battle, right? And then Simba takes the throne. See, that's kind of what the Christmas story is. It's a story about a fake king and the true king coming home to his people. Now, let's think about, let's take this a step further as we talk about this idea of peace. I want you to think about, we're going to think about the type of peace that Caesar would offer and the type of peace that Jesus would offer. Now, why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Very simple. Does anyone know why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Census, right? There, I highlighted in the so, census. Now, oh, this is going to be good. I'm going to redeem myself from last week. If you were here, you know why. You're going to love this. Um, I'm going to give you a description that a historian wrote about a census. This is what a census was like. Listen carefully. In the empire, census takers appeared everywhere. And they produced a crisis everywhere they went. The fields were measured. The grapevine and fruit trees were counted. The livestock of every kind was listed. The exact number of people noted even in independent cities. Everyone came with their whole band of children and slaves. Everyone was heard the screamings of those being interrogated with torture and beatings. Sons were forced to testify against their fathers. Trusty slaves were driven to bear witness against their masters. Wives were driven to give in testimony against their husbands. And when all means had been exhausted, the victims were tortured until they gave evidence against themselves. And when pain had at last conquered, they made taxable taxable property that did not even exist. A census is a terrible time in the Roman Empire. And here is my redemption from last week. A song for you. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. You guys recognize that one? Yes, good, redemption. Um, Here's the thing though, right? That's a beautiful song. Bethlehem was not lying still. And it was not a peaceful time. When you're going back to Bethlehem, you're going with anxiety, you're going with fear because you don't know what's going to happen to you and to your children and to your family. This is a terrible time. Now, of course, Rome had a census for really two reasons. Number one, Rome loved to conquer, to fight, and they needed soldiers. So number one, they'd see how many fighting men they had among the people that they could draw from in time of war. And number two, they just want Rome to survive needed to get taxes out of people. And Rome would just tax as much as they could. They would suck you as dry as they possibly could. The tax rate was usually around 90%. Now, what Rome did, uh, this idea of peace, the absence of conflict, see what Rome did is it had this huge empire. It had to balance the different interests of power. On one hand, you wanted people to have enough resources to survive and to get by. You didn't want them to have too much because then they might have the power and the ability to revolt. So you make sure they have enough. You take the rest to yourself. And just to make sure they don't revolt, you make an example of anybody who does. So if you revolted against Rome, what would they do to you? They put you on a, they put you on a cross, And then they would put your cross up on the side of the streets. So when anybody thought about rebelling against Rome, they'd see the cross. And remember what would happen to them if they did not submit and obey to Rome. You give the people just enough, but not so little that they decide it's worth rebelling to have the cross. You see, this is how peace worked in Rome. Peace in Rome came because they forced the people to obey. That was the idea of Roman peace. Forced submission. But the thing about forcing obedience and submission, it can be really effective. Rome lasted for a very long time. But it will never change a heart, will it? It will never cause the people to love the emperor. And it will never create a real relationship. See, the thing about Caesar, he worked so hard 
to make sure everybody knew how powerful he was so that they would bend their knee to him and they wouldn't rebel. He worked so hard to convince the masses that he was indeed the son of God and the savior of the world. But Jesus was so different, the true son of God. When Jesus came and he walked among the people, Jesus had nothing to prove. In fact, if you read the Gospels, one of the things that you'll discover is Jesus never directly comes out to the people and says, hey, everybody, I'm the Son of God. Check me out. You actually find that if you look at the story of Jesus, you have to look hard to find the signs of his divinity. Now, Jesus drops little hints here and there, and he has some private conversations with his disciples about his divinity and his messiahship. But he doesn't go out and just prove to everybody, everybody, look at me. He doesn't do that. Even sometimes when he performs miracles, he kind of slips away because he doesn't want all the attention. Jesus had nothing to prove as the true Prince of Peace, except perhaps one thing. Jesus came to prove how much he loved every last single person in this room and across planet earth, across all of time. That's the one thing Jesus came to prove. And for Caesar, The cross was an example of what would happen to you if you didn't obey. But Jesus takes this horrific thing the Romans invented and he puts himself on it as a sign of how much he loves each person and what he's willing to take on himself to bring forgiveness and freedom. Jesus doesn't come and force us to bend a knee to him. It's not what he did. Because Jesus wanted something more than just the lack of conflict. Jesus wanted more than forcing people to do what he asked us to do. Jesus came because he wanted a relationship with each of us. And the Christmas story is the reminder that there is a new kind of peace that is offered to humanity. And even, and you look at the story that that Luke tells, I mean, as he puts this time stamp of all the chaos and all the corruption around them, it's not shalom. It's not real peace. It's, it's Roman peace, but it's not the real thing. But the gospel comes and tells us that even when life around us is chaotic and falling apart, when it doesn't make sense, no matter who you are through Jesus, there can be peace because of the presence of Jesus. He's, he's the true king. He's the true prince of peace. He is the true son of of God. It's a good reminder this season of Christmas, isn't it? As we come together, as as we frantically look for the perfect gifts, which I will never find, as we frantically think about how we're going to manage all the crazy family members in our family, which you probably are that person, as we think about, as you think about all the things in our government, all the things in this world, all the reasons to be discouraged and to have anxiety. The Christmas story is an invitation to have peace in the midst of it all. There can be no peace out here. But Jesus says you can have peace in here with a relationship with me. And that's a good thing to remember this season. Now, I love my dear brother, Sherman Glenn, over there. But he did kind of steal the punchline of this sermon because he quoted the words of Jesus And I want to quote the same words to you this morning, but I'm going to put mine on PowerPoint. Um, (laughs) John 14, 27. I'm going to share two verses. He only shared one section. But here's the words of Jesus, and I want to leave this with you in this season as you go out this morning. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives or as Rome gives, right? Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then in John 16, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. It may be chaos on the outside right now, but the promise of Jesus is someday the peace he has brought on the inside is the same peace that will rule across all of creation. Jesus came once and he will come again. And so this Christmas, we have peace, and we have hope, and we have joy. Let us pray. Jesus, we come to you this morning, and we thank you that you are the true Son of God, 
We thank you that you are the true savior of the world. We thank you that you are the Prince of Peace. We thank you that you are Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you offer a special kind of peace to all who would put their trust in you. Thank you that when we trust in you, you fill us with your presence. And we can know peace no matter what the situations around us seem to dictate, Lord. This morning, if you're here and you've never known this kind of peace, we would invite you to trust Jesus with your life this morning. Because his invitation to you is that when you trust in him, he forgives you of your sins. He makes you clean. He comes and he makes his home in your soul. And he gives you peace, a peace that passes understanding, a peace that guards your heart, a peace that is forever, that nobody can take away. Thank you, Jesus, for that peace. And for all of us who already know you, Lord, we know the evil one wants us to think about the things around us and lose our peace. Jesus, we pray you'd silence his voice this morning and in our lives, and you would help us to keep our focus on you and to remember who you are. Jesus, this morning in our worship, we also come to bring our gifts and our offerings to you, Lord. We don't give to you because you forced us to bend a knee. We get to give to you out of a joy for the kind of God that you are. And so, Lord, as we give to you this morning, we give with joy and generosity. We pray that you would use this offering for your purposes, God. Would you continue to bless this body you've called to be a church? May you give wisdom to us and the leaders to use your resources according to your, to your will, Lord. Thank you. We pray this in your name. God's people said, amen.